Today I'm going to be showing you how I design cycloidal gears, sometimes called cycloidal discs, in Fusion 360. All of the methods that I've seen to make cycloidal drives or cycloidal discs are not very intuitive for a program like Fusion 360, so I'm making this video to explain exactly how it can be done. So this is a cycloidal drive. As you can see, you spin the input shaft and the output ring slowly spins. So for this video, I'll be assuming that you already know what a cycloidal drive is and how they work fundamentally, and that you have at least a rudimentary level of CAD skills, specifically with Fusion 360. So the first thing I'm going to do is, of course, start a sketch. And then in this sketch, I'm going to put two circles, one on the center and then one over here. Then I'm going to constrain these two circles together with a tangent constraint. So before we actually get making this thing, there's two parameters that we need to decide on. The first parameter we need to figure out is the diameter of the pins that we'll be using for a cycloidal disc. And the pins are all of these cylinders that you see around the cycloidal disc. So in my case, I'll be designing this to use five millimeter pins. So that means that all of these cylinders will have five millimeters diameter. And the one that I'm making will not have this many lobes on it. It'll be simpler so that you can more easily see the final product. And then the other parameter is the diameter of this circle, which ends up being approximately the diameter of the finished cycloidal disc, although it's not quite exact. And then, of course, you also need to know what your desired gear ratio coming out of this needs to be. So for this example, I'll be designing a cycloidal drive with a 10 to 1 gear reduction. Based off of all the times that I've designed these cycloidal drives, you actually have some leeway in what you want to make the total diameter. So when determining the diameter of your inner circle here, it needs to be some fraction of the total gear reduction that you want times the diameter of your pins. So in my case, I want a 10 to 1 gear reduction, and I have 5 millimeter pins, so 5 times 10. So I could make a cycloidal drive with 50 millimeter diameter, but that's a little bit spread out. I generally don't want that much. So I'll multiply this whole thing by two thirds to get a more compact format. So that comes out to be 33.3 repeating. Like I said earlier, you do have some leeway with this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and make it 33 just for the sake of ease. Now the diameter of your tangent circle needs to be the diameter of your larger one divided by your total desired gear reduction, which in my case is 10. So if you had this same kind of setup, but you wanted a 20 to 1 gear reduction, you could just take 33 over 20, and then that would be the diameter of your smaller circle. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get a very specific shape, which is the cycloid, which is what the name cycloidal drive comes from. And a cycloid comes from tracking a single point on a circle as you essentially roll it. So what we're going to be doing is, in a way, rolling this small circle around the larger one and tracking a single point on it. The reason that this needs to be a certain size relative to the larger one is because it needs to roll around exactly the number of times of your desired gear reduction. So this diameter being the tenth of the diameter of this, it could roll around exactly ten times and then come back to the same starting position. This is the magic formula that's needed to make the perfect cycloidal drive. But actually setting this up gets a little bit interesting. So I'm going to start by drawing a line from the center, and these are all construction lines, by the way, to the center of my outer circle. Then I'll also draw another one from the center just to the very top of my circle. And then one more from the center of my small circle out to the side. So it looks something like this right now. So now I'm going to use my dimensioning tool to give an angle to these two lines. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm just going to leave it at 59 for now. Now I'll give an angle to these two lines that is relative to the previous angle. So I'll just click on this one, and I'll show D3 because that is the third dimension that I've made on here. And now I'm going to divide it by my desired gear reduction, which again in my case is 10. So if this was a 20 to 1, you'd be dividing this angle by 20. Hit enter on that, and it should change it. So now as I change this value to, let's say, 180, the other angle will move accordingly. So to make our cycloid, we will be tracking this point where the circle and the line meet, 
and we will be continually changing this angle in order to get that smooth motion. So first I want to put a point at where it starts to roll, which would be zero degrees. But if I try to do zero degrees in here, it's not going to let me. It doesn't like zero degrees. But I know, based off of this, that if it was zero degrees, it would be right here. So I don't need to worry about that. I can go ahead and put a point right there. So I'm just going to use the point tool and then stick a point there. That one's nice and simple. So now I'm going to go through 0 to 180 degrees and track that point. So I'm going to start with 5 degrees. And you have to zoom way in to, to be able to see it. So now I'm going to stick a point where this smaller circle and this line meet. And with this point, I need to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ground it, which is just this lock constraint here. So now it's fixed in place. And you can tell that because it turns green. Now, I can't move my circle because it's stuck to it. So I'm going to select this point then I'm going to delete these two coincident constraints. So just click on the constraint, hit delete, click on the point again, constraint, delete. Now we have a point here, which is fixed in place and not connected to anything else. So I can move the circle once again. So I'll zoom back out a little bit, change my five degrees to 10 degrees. Now I'll go back in. You'll notice that the line will extend beyond here a little bit. That's fine. It's just because you've disconnected the two. It, there's no point in reconnecting them because it'll just keep disconnecting at every point you add. So then again, I'll go in and add a point. I'll fix it in place. And then I'll delete the two coincident constraints so it's free of the circle. So I usually start with 5 degrees, then go to 10, then 20, then 30. And then from that point, I go by increments of 15 degrees. I do this because the point where they come together is one of the most critical spots. And it's very important that these be accurate. And that the spline, which we'll add in later, knows exactly where it needs to be. So I went from 30 to 45, because I'm going by 15s now. And I'll just keep on going until I get to 180 degrees. The degree increments you use between points is also what will determine your accuracy. So if you were to use infinite points here, then your cycloidal drive should be truly perfect with no gaps whatsoever. But the fewer points that you have in here, the more likely that there'll be a little bit of wiggle room between the actual disk and the pins. So now I've got half of my points in. Instead of continuing to track the circle and adding them all in manually, I'm instead just going to use the mirror tool and select all of these points and then mirror it across this construction line that I already have here. So then once I've done that, you can start to see the cycloid shape come in. And now you just take a spline, specifically a fit to point spline, and then connect all of the points. If your computer isn't very good like mine is, the program can get pretty laggy once you zoom way into those really small points. So now we have our approximated cycloid. Of course, it's not truly perfect. Again, the more points you have on here, the more accurate it will be. So now that we've got this, I'm going to use a circular pattern to repeat it around the center point. So I'll select the cycloid for my object and the center point, and then since it's going to be a 10 to 1, I will, of course, want 10 copies of it. Now, if your smaller circle was sized correctly relative to your larger circle, these should all meet at points. They shouldn't overlap at all. There shouldn't be any gaps. They should be one contiguous shape. But this is not the exact shape that we want. What we want is an offset version of this. So I'm not exactly sure where the offset thing is in here but you can just press the O key, it'll bring up the offset panel, and I want to offset three of these. So this is going on the outside, that's not what I want. I want to offset it by a negative amount, so it goes on the inside, and I want to do it by the radius of my pins. So remember, I'm using five millimeter pins, so it's going to be negative 2.5. So now we've got this squiggly shape in here. This is the shape that we want. You might notice that these curves are just circles, and that these ones are kind of shrunken copies of the cycloids. So these curves are cycloids, and then these are just normal circular arcs. So now I'm going to go in and delete all of these little artifacts that it leaves behind. And then I'm also going to trim off the curves on the end. This is not absolutely necessary. It just looks better to me. 
So now we've got one total lobe here. So now once again, I'm going to use my circular pattern and select these three curves as my objects, then the center point for my center point. I'll rotate it around 10 times. Again, this should be your desired output gear ratio. So now we have the general cycloidal drive shape. It's not super smooth. As you can see, there is a little bit of a sharp corner here, but that's perfectly fine. And you'll see once I make up the frame that these sharp points should in fact be there. I'm also going to add a 10 millimeter hole in the middle. This is where the eccentric bearing will go and I'm making it a little oversized just so that I don't have to go back and change it later. So now stop the sketch and extrude this and you now have a cycloidal disc. Now I'm also going to quickly draw up a frame for this to go into so that you can see that it does actually do what a cycloidal drive is supposed to do. So I just went ahead and made up these two frame pieces here and then converted everything into components so that we can assemble them. There's a few things that you need to know for how to make these. So for this frame, I've got 11 pins here. So remember, this is a 10 to 1 gear reduction. The cycloidal disc itself has 10 lobes on it, but the frame will have 11 pins. So the frame should always be one more than the disc. Now the distance of the center of these pins to the center of your frame is very important. It should be the exact same as the distance from the center of your cycloidal disc to the center of your smaller circle. So I just use my inspect to click the center there, go to the center here, it was 18.15, so that's what I used. So all of these circles are 18.15 millimeters away from the center point. Then this little circle over here is representing the eccentric bearing, or at least the eccentric spacer inside of a bearing. The distance between the centers of the outer circle and the inner circle, which goes on the shaft, is half of the diameter of your small circle in your cycloidal disc drawing. So remember, my small circle has a diameter of 3.3. So the distance between these two circle centers is 1.65, which is, of course, half of 3.3. So now to put it all together, I'm first going to ground the main frame here. Then I'll put a revolute joint on the center here so that our eccentric bearing can circle around here. Now I'll put another revolute joint connecting the cycloidal disc to the eccentric bearing. So nothing is coinciding here, which means that we're doing something right at least. Now I'm going to add a motion link between these two joints. So I'll reverse it. When I do this, they're rotating at the same speed in opposite direction, so nothing actually moves. So then on the one here, I will add 360 over 10. So then it'll rotate a tenth of a rotation for every input rotation. Again, if this was a so then if this was a 20 to 1 gear reduction system, this would be 360 over 20. Then you can see it's going in the wrong direction since it's coinciding with these pins. So I'll just reverse it. And it kind of looks like it's freaking out, but you can always just hit OK so you can actually see it. So that didn't really work out, so I'm going to instead add my number to the top one here. So there we go. Now we have a proper rotation. So as it makes a full rotation, there's no point during which the cycloidal disc goes inside of any of the pins. It's always just touching the outside. So now if I manually turn the eccentric bearing in the middle, it continues to rotate properly at the one-tenth speed. So if a cycloidal drive is designed perfectly, it will maintain one point of contact, or at least the cycloidal disc will maintain one point of contact with each and every one of the pins at all time. So if I use my inspect tool and select the top face of this and the edge of one of these pins, the distance is 0 0.005 millimeters, so five thousandths of a millimeter. This one is 14 thousandths, 4 thousandths, 14, 0, so that's perfect. So these two are exactly touching but not overlapping. This one's 1 thousandth, 
This one's three. So it seems kind of random, and it essentially is random. In the beginning, I said that the more points that you track when you're creating that original cycloid pattern at the very beginning is going to determine how accurate your final cycloid is. So if you had infinite points, then each of these would say zero. They would have a perfect distance of zero on every pin. But since we can't have that, it's not going to be. But if it, instead of going every 15 degrees, you went every 10 or every 5 degrees, your results would be significantly more accurate. Okay, so you might not be able to get it to zero for every pin all the time, but you should be able to get it within less than a micron. So there you have it. This is the complete cycloid. The number of instructions on how to actually design this was severely lacking on YouTube, so hopefully I can make up for that at least just a little bit. I've spent literally two years trying to figure out how to design this properly, and it's only until now that I've actually done it the right way. I'm sure there's plenty of other ways and probably many that are much easier than mine, but this is how I figured out how to do it, and it's definitely good enough for me. So hopefully this can be a resource or of value to someone, but that's all I have for now, so bye.